so excited. So many people from so many different organizations really around the world could join us for this event and we're eager to get your thoughts on how to make the city we need a resilient city. Uh, my name is Samer Saliba. I'm the Urban Response Learning Manager at the International Rescue Committee. I'm working specifically on the DFID-funded Urban Crises Grant in partnership with the International Institute for Environment and Development. And prior to this role, I worked uh, as an urban planner on various resiliency building projects really in the United States, helping to bolster the resilience of New York City communities uh, following Hurricane Sandy, and then using that experience to help states such as Connecticut develop ideas that earn them millions of dollars in funding through programs such as the National Disaster Resilience Competition. My co-host is Aline Rahbani. Uh, she's the Urban Advisor and World Vision's Center of Expertise for Urban Programming. She's been with World Vision for eight years and is at the forefront of World Vision's work as it relates to both humanitarian and development contexts in cities throughout the globe. You'll hear from her a little later on, uh, and she'll tell you more about, about the Urban Thinkers Campus process, how it ties into the World Urban Campaigns, the City We Need Draft 2.0, and, and Habitat 3. Uh, before we get to all that, before we get to the webinar, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce the topic, its organizers and partners, and uh, this, this idea of resilience. The UTC is organized by World Vision and the International Rescue Committee, two organizations that have extensive experience doing both humanitarian and development work in cities. Aline and I are supported by our urban expert colleagues, Joy Adidas and Joanna Henderson, and we are taking this opportunity to highlight some of the work our respective organizations are doing to build resilience in Armenia and Somalia, which Gergen Boshian and Abdiaziz Youssef will present later on. Gergen is the Humanitarian Emergencies Affairs Expert for World Vision South Caucasus, and Abdiaziz is IRC Somalia's Livelihoods Coordinator. Uh, we're happy to be partnered with several organizations, including IEED, DFID, UN Habitat, and ALNAP. It's important to note that these organizations are, are not only our partners on this UTC, but are also involved with other resiliency initiatives from which we draw the preliminary recommendations. David Dodman, for example, is a member of the Ecology and Resilience Policy Unit for Habitat 3. Philippe Decourt, who you will hear from later on, and Lucy Earle are part of the Urban Coordination Cell and, er and organizing the Global Alliance for Urban Crises. And Lucy is also part of the Social Cultural Urban Framework Policy Unit. Special thanks goes to Leah and so uh, Campbell and Sophie at ALNAP for, for hosting this UTC and allowing us to use ALNAP's community of practice as a communications platform. So we have two hours to get through this agenda. I know it's a very long time to hold your attention, but I promise it's worth your while, so grab some coffee and get comfortable. Uh, we have interesting and extremely relevant case studies to present from the cities of Mogadishu in Somalia and Stepanovan City in Armenia, two cities that you really typically won't hear about in, uh, in international discourse on urban resilience. Those case studies give weight to the recommendations that we've developed um, and circulated ahead of time. And we will use the second hour of this webinar to really get your thoughts and dig into those recommendations. Uh, now I'll just turn it over to Aline, but just first to, to show the role of resilience and the topic of this webinar is, is really about both humanitarian and development and really local actors as well. And using the resilience framework to, to bridge everybody uh, on, the, on the same page as we build urban resilience. So without further ado, here's Aline. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first and the only virtual Urban Thinkers Campus. In the next five minutes or so, I'll be giving you an overview of, what, of why are we organizing this webinar and where does it fit in the big picture. Starting backwards, most of you would know that this year is a big year for the urban world and the urban actors. In October 2016, an important meeting is happening in Quito, Ecuador, Habitat 3 conference. During this meeting, the new urban agenda will be determined for the next 20 years. This agenda will guide the efforts of all urban actors, including local, national, and regional governments, funding agencies, and civil society at large. So who will be writing this agenda? Well, the agenda is influenced by a series of formal and informal events in the lead up to Habitat 3 meeting. This Urban Thinkers Campus organized today is one of them. Urban Thinkers Campus is originally an initiative launched by the World Urban Campaign, which is a habit, habitat unit, in an effort to influence the zero draft of the new urban agenda. The World Urban Campaign partners, World Vision being one of them, chose different themes to organize Urban Thinkers Campuses around. The outcome of all campuses will serve to improve the city we need document, which will in turn feed into the new urban agenda at Habitat 3. 
The city we need is a collective contrib contribution of committed partners united by shared goals and common vision of the city for the 21st century. The first version of the city we need was prepared by the World Urban Campaign in 2013. It was launched in March 2014, just before World Urban Forum 7. It represents a first consensus of all partners engaged in the global coalition and sets nine principles that you can see now on the screen. The outcome of, of this Urban Thinkers Campus and all other 28 Urban Thinkers Campuses planned is to contribute to the draft two of the city we need, which will be drafted by the end of this February. So to go back to this webinar and look at it again in light of the big picture, today we'll be the recommendations that we would like to submit for the city we need draft 2.0. We will be discussing recommendations with you during the call, but we'll also allow for others who were not able to participate today to give their input within a seven-day online consultation process through a survey that we will send out shortly after this call. After that, we'll be writing the outcomes of the Urban Thinkers Campus and submitting them to the World Urban Campaign organizers for them to take into consideration as they draft the revised version of the city we need and contribute with it to the zero draft of the new urban agenda. I will hand over now back to Sam to introduce you to our goal and what we hope to achieve during this goal. Thank you. Thanks, Aline. So, so as I mentioned, uh, the, the, our goal really is to develop recommendations around urban resilience. And it's important that you all feed into those recommendations, that we hear your perspective. Because you know, the way we're phrasing this, this UTC is that resilience is an ideal framework to get the perspectives of different people and, and to encourage collaboration between uh, organizations who have different mandates and, and things like that. Um, but before we get to the case studies, I, I think it's really important to pause and consider the definition of resilience, which, as we all know, has fast become a buzzword, and buzzwords tend to lose their meaning over time. So let's take a second to, to really reflect on urban resilience. 100 Resilient Cities defines urban resilience as a city's ability to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what types of crises it experiences. This definition, I think, is really critical for our purposes because it hits on both the, a role for humanitarians to help cities survive and adapt and grow, but, but, um, and for development actors to help cities adapt and grow. So it, it provides, in this definition, a role for both humanitarian and development actors. It's also important to note, looking at the examples of stresses and shocks that you see on the screen, that many of the crises that uh, urban resilience addresses are the same crises that humanitarians respond to every day. The key point to remember is that ur urban resilience seeks to help cities grow from these crises rather than simply respond to them. This is really why we feel that urban resilience as a framework is a useful tool to, to, bi to bridge that uh, ever elusive humanitarian and development divide. It's also important to consider the many different ways we can build resilient cities. This is part of the reason why resilience is so broadly used. It speaks to resourcefulness as much of inclu as, as inclusiveness, integration as much as flexibility. These different characteristics are important to, to remember as any one of them can lead to a more resilient city. And finally, as we can see from Arab Resilience Framework, which I'm sure some of you are very familiar with, I think this is good because there is no one solution to building urban resilience. Using this comprehensive framework, resilient cities pull from four categories, the outermost ring of the circle you see there, um, making up 12 resilience indicators in, in yellow. Um, and I like this framework because it shows that no two cities are, that two cities can be equally resilient, but that the reasons why may be completely different. This is both the beauty and the challenge of urban resiliency and, and really cities in general. All that being said, and the reason why we're having this UTC, is that there's a gap between cities that are able to apply resilient frameworks such as Arabs and other cities that are, to put it bluntly, left behind. There is a need for joint thinking that links the principles of urban humanitarian response and urban development, and resilience building and the framework of resilience building may help us do just that. So let's take a moment to consider two pretty well-known examples, um, Port-au-Prince and New York City. So in New York, you have a city with strong society, a robust and well-planned infrastructure network, and all the other characteristics you'd expect from a wealthy city. Because of all these factors, the shock of Hurricane Sandy was met with a rapid emergency response and quickly followed by uh, countless re really re resilience building initiatives to address future crises. The federal, state, and city governments each had their own initiatives to build New York's resilience and, and they're ongoing as we speak. 
Compare that to Port-au-Prince, a poor, more vulnerable city that experienced a greater shock uh, in the earthquake, and you'll find that the response and the continued vulnerability of the majority of residents is in many ways still a humanitarian endeavor. For many reasons that I won't get into, the city and its international partners could not move forward from humanitarian response to one of resilience building fast enough. Cities such as Port-au-Prince are too often left out of the resilience paradigm, even though they are the cities that would, at least in my opinion, most benefit from programs that build urban resilience. As this slide shows, and this is something that I, I like to take around in my back pocket everywhere I go, uh, crises offer opportunities to move cities from point A to point B. It also shows that resilience should not be simply about maintaining a status quo, but that it should be about betterment and improving the quality of life for all residents, especially the most vulnerable, as we mentioned uh, repeatedly in our draft recommendations. I like, I like a quote from Margot Chrysler, someone who was part of the city of Christchurch in New, Zeal New Zealand when it experienced two large earthquakes in a matter of months. She put it this way, she said, shocks reveal weaknesses and opportunities. They break down barriers and encourage new ideas and collaboration. And I think that's really telling because that is why resilient strategies are useful not only in addressing crises but building from them as well. So you'll hear this idea applied in practice from our two excellent speakers in just a few moments. With Abdi Aziz talking about Mogadishu and building resilience in a humanitarian context, not by, not by disaster risk reduction as is commonly linked to resilience, but by reducing vulnerability and strengthening local markets and promoting livelihoods for the most vulnerable. Mogadishu is, is really a timely case study as it fo faces both historic threats as well as new ones with El Nino currently raising the risk of drought. That being said, Somalia is progressing enough for the country's UN humanitarian coordinator in the 2016 humanitarian response plan for the country to state, and I quote, our aid effort will not only give a hand out but a hand up to save lives and foster resilience. 2016 is not just another year of aid delivery, but one that makes a difference in building the resilience of the people in Somalia. So, so the UN is, is starting to, to, to use this idea of resilience for countries such as Somalia and cities such as Mogadishu. After Abdi Aziz, you'll, you'll hear from Gergen, who will talk about resilience building in a development context generally, and specifically by focusing on capacity building and stakeholder engagement, two areas that we discuss in our recommendations. By giving us a glimpse into Stepanovan City's resilience planning strategy, Gergen will highlight how focusing on leadership and strategy can build urban resilience and the importance of a participatory planning framework. So I won't spend too much time on this slide, but this is just to reiterate that this process is about you. It's about our, our audience and making sure that your perspectives and experiences feed into the, our recommendations for planning and building resilient cities. Oops. We have, a, we have a uniquely diverse audience and therefore a tremendous opportunity to hear different perspectives. From my last count, and this is more have registered since then, you come from 61 different countries, 116 different cities, and 174 organizations of who knows how many mandates. And you are also probably my mom because she's listening too. You've already submitted some excellent questions, and we'll address some of these questions during this UTC and in our recommendations, but others, such as question number two, we won't address. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not important, but uh, it's more that we think that you do a better job answering them than we would. Measuring resilience, question two states, for example, is something that I'm quite curious about as well. Our case studies will touch on a lot of these questions, uh, such as those highlighted in blue. Question four relates directly to Stepanovan City and engaging various stakeholders in resilience planning. Well, question eight, I think, is a really great question that Abdi Aziz will, will touch on when he discusses resilience as a means for improvement, especially for residents of Mogadishu who are already resilient, but they're, res but they're resilient because they've had to adapt to their enduring vulnerability. So how do we take that existing resilience and really build on it so, so that resilience is about betterment? So before I turn it over to Abdi Aziz, I ask again that you all keep in mind the main goal of this UTC and consider how the case studies relate to our zero draft recommendations. So let's queue up Abdi Aziz and without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Abdi Aziz, IRC Somalia's Livelihoods Coordinator, to talk about building market resilience in Mogadishu through humanitarian action. All right, um, thank you, Samir, uh, and uh, hello, everybody. 
Uh, I'll be discussing a, uh, be talking about this case study uh, on Mogadishu, and uh, and hopefully you can, uh, yeah, be be really interested in Mogadishu after this presentation. So um, Mogadishu, uh, as a city, has uh, historically had a, a few um, key points. Um, I think from 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 our own experiences of what we perceive of Mogadishu to be, we. We know what happened during the collapse of the civil, uh, the collapse of the country, the government, and the general lawlessness that has that has engulfed the city during the almost past 25 years. Um, just to let you know that Mogadishu is is the capital city of Somalia. Uh, it's a coastal city with a population of around 2.2 um, uh, million uh, people, uh, with the latest UN estimates. Um, it's believed to have been founded in the 10th century uh, with, with several Arab, uh, Somali, Persian and Portuguese and Italian dynasties vying for its control um, over the past millennia. Um, after the collapse of the Seattle government in uh, 1991, um, the city has had like significant spells of lawlessness, violence between warlords and terrorists trying to control the city and its resources. Um, but thankfully, uh, during the past uh, few years, the, the federal government of Somalia, supported by the African Union and also with support from the international community, have had uh, control over the city. Uh, and, and now it's starting to, to improve and, and prosper, which I'll touch on a little bit later. So just to give you an idea of, of what Mogadishu used to be like, you can see some, some uh, old postcard photos of Mogadishu back in this 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and uh, it, 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 at the time it was a very well planned, well thought out city, which was quite prosperous uh, along the uh, the Indian Ocean, um, and uh, it's it's yeah, it was quite beautiful, uh, still is actually. So I think when, as as we all know, that the city um, suffered a, a collapse as well as the country, and you can see that some of the the, the images in in of Mogadishu during during the war. On your the top left hand corner you'll see um, the the Mogadishu Catholic Cathedral which is uh, the largest which was the largest uh, Catholic um, cathedral in Africa at the time and it was functioning full functioning up until 1990 um, but you can see the damage caused. Uh, at the bottom left hand corner you'll be able to see a it was a beautiful five star hotel called Aruba Hotel, which was uh, which was the the hot spot in Mogadishu uh, during before the collapse of the civil war, and now it's um, pretty much in ruins, or was pretty much in ruins. And uh, on the top right hand corner, you'll be able to see what is remaining of uh, Somalia's parliament building, um, and uh, it's not a it wasn't a pretty sight, um, as you can see. So we've yeah we've seen that Mogadishu has had had certain challenges. Um, but you can also you can also see that um, through these images that, I, that I'm showing on the on the left hand side that the Mogad the city itself is is improving it's it's, uh, it's 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 gaining momentum again. There's a real hustle and bustle about the place, and it has it. I mean, it is growing. Um, just general as you can see from from the main bullet points, the city is around just over two million populants. Uh, population um, and but in and, in and amongst that population we we have around 370,000 displaced people um, from conflict, drought uh, or and even just generally trying to find economic opportunities within the city uh, and fleeing from from uh, from famine in the more rural areas. Uh, the country itself, Somalia, is in transition um, there have been significant improvements, and, and the UN is focusing on moving things forward, as, as Sam has suggested earlier on. Um, but we still estimate that there are around 4.9 million people who are in need of humanitarian assistance, uh, out of a population of 12.3 million, uh, which is which is quite, which is a significantly high number. Um, we can also say that there are around just over a million um, people who are who are internally displaced. In Somalia, uh, again, which is which is uh, a significant amount of the population. Um, however, despite of these challenges, um, the I mean, Somalia's economy is growing. 
uh, I mean, the recent estimates were 3.7% in 2014 and probably higher in 2015. Uh, we can also say that, I mean, I'm, it's not in the presentation, but Somalia is Africa's largest livestock export. Um, so we, we export goats, sheep, camels, um, mostly to the Middle East, and, uh, and it's, it's the primary source of income uh, for Somalia. With our role uh, as IRC, we've been trying to blend uh, a certain diff or differing types of interventions. We know that um, the city is evolving, uh, the city is growing, and we also understand that there are needs, uh, humanitarian needs, that, that have to be met, but, but also we have to be able to address the systematic um, aspects of trying to transform the city. And we can't obviously do it alone ourselves, and Mogadishu is a city with, with a number of actors and agencies um, who are trying to, 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 to push it forward uh, with support from the federal government. So just to give you a bit of background, um, so, uh, again, Mogadishu is an estimated 370,000 displaced people, uh, persons, um, and IRC has been active in Mogadishu since uh, 2011, uh, when when the when the famine um, happened in in Somalia that that um, fortunately killed over 300,000 people, um, we've been able to to implement health programmings uh, as well as livelihoods, and now we've uh, with the support from uh, DFID, uh, we've uh, we're implementing a a resiliency program called Building Resilient Communities in Somalia, um, acronym. Bricks, uh, with with uh, a few other agencies such as Save the Children and uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council, to, to name a few. Um, we've tried to um, target communities with more short-term, absorptive, immediate uh, hum uh, humanitarian needs, and in addition to that, a bit more uh, on on systematic and transformative attempts, uh, mainly through. The development of livelihood opportunities, uh, improving or increasing employability within the city, and also trying to develop market uh, market uh, linkages and analysis for us to to better know what to do and how within the city um, for 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 livelihoods. So from from that you can you can you can see that we've uh, we're, we're trying to 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 support I mean uh, basic needs in terms of uh, minimal, um, trying to support the minimal vulnerability and, and increase or improve uh, people's vulnerabilities uh, at the household level. Um, again, through through cash-based support, if it's in an emergency, or more systematic, longer-term training, business development, grant provision, and market analysis and access that we're trying to do. Um, this will then, in turn, support improve the diverse livelihood opportunities within the city. Um, again, we're doing that through support, through access to finance, uh, ability to to, to accrue savings and, and skills training, um, which is which is which is uh, yeah a very positive positive thing in terms of in what we see as trying to build resilience within within the communities, household, and eventually the city. Um, we can also say that the the city itself is. Uh, how can I say? It, it, we, we don't specifically just do livelihoods. However, we're also working towards um, improving health uh, and and also um, basic health needs. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much on this for this presentation. But if you at, at some point, if you're interested in the the health uh, work that we do, I can I can I can point you to the right direction. Um, and. I mean, finally, we could uh, everything that we do within the city uh, leads into developing community linkages. We we have to do things through the communities, uh, through the district commissioners within the city. Uh, engagement is is a strong priority in 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 what we do, and uh, and we're trying to move away from this top down approach that, that unfortunately has been done so often. In, in Mogadishu with, with aid and humanitarian actors. What could we say uh, with in, in regards to building resilience? And uh, I may I may have touched it a bit earlier, but but we're 
we're, it can be seen that we're trying to improve uh, the, the situation of populations in an emergency. Um, and it's definitely a mandate for us to, as IRC, to focus on, on households and individuals that have been affected by emergencies and shocks. Um, communities who are, could be seen as IDPs, refugees or returnees, trying to find a better, by, a better life back home. Um, and in response to this, we've been uh, implementing cash transfers to support the immediate need, as, as I've said. Uh, and, and actually, a good element, a good point of this is that we've uh, recently, during the, the, Yemen, the Yemen civil war, the Yemeni civil war, we've had a lot of Yemeni uh, refugees and Somalis who fled to Yemen during the civil war fleeing back to Somalia uh, because of the Yemeni civil war and we've uh, enabled them to, we've supported them with immediate support um, which is through cash-based cash -based programming. But we also understand that this is not um, the, the ultimate goal. We would like, if, if those communities are, are willing to come back to Mogadishu and stay in Mogadishu, that they, they, they need more transformative, longer-term support. And that's where our business training, skills development and, and market-based um, type of uh, analysis and support uh, in the long run will have a will, will eventually give them a better advantage to to prosper and and, and live within Mogadishu. Um, we uh, again we're also working with with uh, local municipalities uh, and district commissioners within the city, um, mainly due to the huge influx of of, of refugees, IDPs. And returnees from from Yemen, um, which which in itself is is a good thing. We've we've managed to register uh, a large number of refugees and returnees with the, with the UN and also IOM as well. So it's given us uh, it's given us that 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 uh, yeah I could say um, positive uh, more longer term hopefully um, support transitioning from emergency into into more recovery and development type of program. Um, so uh, for sustainable resilience, uh, as you can see that we've, we, I mean, again, it's how, how do we bridge the gap between humanitarian and development and local actors? Um, I think that for, for, for us, uh, our, our strategy could be seen as trying to improve livelihoods through job creation, employment creation, delivery of basic services, uh, and meeting clear humanitarian and emergency demands within the city. Uh, the whole notion of bridging the gap is very much in our in our mind frame, and we know that um, strengthening markets, understanding uh, value chains, understanding how to improve value addition, is also a, a, a primary thing for us in, in in bettering people's lives or on resiliency through through this approach. And we also know that youths within the city have been uh, kind of, uh, I would say. And not ha not having enough opportunities, um, but we're we're looking at improving sectors such as fishing, uh, and also like uh, scaling up. We know that uh, tuk tuks are a big thing in Mogadishu, particularly for the youths, and and it's uh, it's it's an, it's a it's actually a growing uh, growing sector, uh, and we're looking at also supporting people uh, use driving tuk tuks and owning tuk tuks, but in a safe safe manner in Mogadishu. Um, I could also say that, sorry, in order to bridge the gap um, uh, in stimulating small and medium enterprises is also uh, vital um, to to, pro to like promote uh, market development and also improve livelihoods in the long run. Um, so, question is, how could we as humanitarians, or how can humanitarian principles inform both DRR and post-disaster? Uh, sorry, disaster preparedness and post-disaster recovery strategies. I think that through the resiliency framework, uh, the fact that we're working alongside several other agencies uh, as part of a, an overall consortium, we, we're managing to identify specific areas within the city uh, where, we, where each agency has a presence and also focusing on what each agency is actually good at doing. Uh, and, and linking in local communities, local district district officials, local government to provide a more disaster ready 
preparedness approach or disaster focused approach. Uh, I think that all throughout the agencies uh, we're working with our specific communities to create disaster management plans uh, which links in with DRR and also hopefully I mean we're, we're trying to develop an early warning system uh, within within the city uh, as a way to to be better prepared uh, and theoretically each community will have these plans in place and will have a and will be able to uh, support uh, will be able to be supported by the local local district commissioners when a, when a disaster occurs again we, we know that um, we know that resilient strategies are differ from city to city um, but in terms of Mogadishu I feel that it's a unique case for resilience because the usual disaster risk reduction approach may not be so clear, clear cut. Um, the city has been in relative insecurity for almost 25 years. It faces significant humanitarian and infrastructural challenges um, because of weak government violence and an influx of, of conflict affected populations. But on the flip side on the other side, we can say that Mogadishu has been resilient for the past two decades. Um, and because of uh, business, the diaspora, public investment and constructions of homes, it's leading towards a positive um, longer term approach uh, and, and stability. So um, in terms of recommendations, uh, I think you can see that um, we feel that Mogadishu, uh, in terms of resilience, it should be an integrated part of development and having longer term outcomes is important. The economy is a big, big option within the city and, and linking in markets and uh, and also improving people's, uh, incre supporting people's vulnerabilities to, to be less vulnerable is an important aspect. Inclusive empowerment and hopefully that uh, we can create unique opportunities within the city um, to build resiliency. Um, and once again, we also know that populations tend to be resilient in their own way and it's a, it should be a, a good way for us to, to improve upon how people are already resilient and, and then move forward and to, to, to improve the situation. Um, so uh, on that note, I'll turn over to Gergen from World Vision uh, for his case study. And again, if anyone has any more questions on, on mortgage issue, please feel free to ask or send me an email. Thank you. Um, thank you to Abdi Aziz for your update and, and the fascinating case study of Mogadishu that I hope people have some interesting questions around. Um, and I hope we'll also take the opportunity to, to reach out to Abdi Aziz. We'll be providing his email later on. Um, but for now, I'd like to turn it over to Gergen at World Vision to talk to us about Stepan Ivan City and our second and last case study. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Abdul Aziz, for a very interesting presentation. And hello to everyone. I will give a presentation related to Stepana 1 resilience building process. A bit of information re related to socio-economic situation uh, of the city. Stepana 1 has a 167 local enterprises. Mining industry as a main job opportunity, pro opportunity provides job for 350 people. Livestock is another key sector of population income uh, pop, uh, population's income about 20 percent of uh, population uh, it has a uh, financial institutions eight banks branches uh, Stepana one has also 13 NGOs Stepana one uh, due to uh, and forest and uh, due to its nature it was a former touristic center for the former Soviet Union countries and uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union and due to a hardship uh, economic condition, number of tourists of course dramatically declined. And for time being there, uh, the city is trying to do its best in order to recover this uh, process and the image which they have. Uh, for time being, about 10% of the population uh, uh, migrated uh, either to uh, outside of the country or internally. How we started the resilience building process? First of all, uh, we have introduced a resilience uh, process to a disaster risk reduction national platform. And the number of, uh, of organizations has been agreed who has an interest in a resilience building. We have established in a way thematic group where UNDP, UNOCHA, UNICEF, Oxfam, Save the Children, 
Crisis Management Academy from Institutional Services. And Ministry of Emergency Situation uh, becomes a member of this uh, resilience thematic group. We have agreed that we will be working on three levels, on the national level, on the regional level, and also on the community level. Uh, on the national level, we have started to advocate to Ministry of Emer Emergency Situation as well as Ministry of Territorial Administrations in order to have some changes in the local self-governance law, because our law didn't say anything about disaster management as such. It says something about civil protection, but it's more related to, I would say, in a way, uh, defense part, rather than it speaks about disaster management. And as a result, uh, there were an amendment to, to uh, self-government law and disaster risk management included as an obligatory part for local authorities. Next step was also, uh, we have a four years uh, community uh, development, uh, some kind of processes, uh, and we have included this uh, disaster risk management as a part of four years community development plan, moreover to template uh, where this plan should be developed. On the regional level, uh, we have started uh, to accent to make an uh, accent on a development of capacity of regional governmental institutions who is responsible for disaster management. I should say that we have a Ministry of Emergency Situation, and of course they are quite strong, but they are strong mainly in a response, uh, and uh, I would say in a way that uh, uh, preparedness and risk reduction uh, it it is considered as an less important. And from that point of view, on the regional level, with the rescue services, which is under the Minister of Emergency Situation, we have started, uh, organize, we have started to organize trainings and workshops uh, in disaster risk reduction as well as in uh, resilience, in order that, with expectations that afterwards, this, the, this, this is the human force uh, which could be supporting communities in uh, building their capacity in a uh, uh, and giving a technical advice in a resilience building and uh, community uh, community development. Uh, why city of Stepanovan has been chosen? Uh, for three, uh, even four reasons. One, first of all, we know we knew that a um, mayor of the city is quite open mind and development oriented person. This is one, and he is. Uh, always going for initiative, uh, innovations. The second thing is that the uh, city has human and financial resor uh, resources, not much, a bit of limited, but still some. And third one, existence of NGO sector in the city of Stepanavan. And fourth, which is also very important, there were a local NGO organization, which is a rescue team, which was uh, quite experienced and has a knowledge not only in the rescue services, but also in a disaster risk reduction. These four, four main, I would say, uh, topics which has, uh, uh, which has give us an uh, idea that we have to pilot our project in Stepanavan City. How a process has, has been organized? First of all, of course, it was about synthesization of idea. We met a mayor of the city as well as we met a, a management of the city. We introduced a resilience roadmap and concept uh, in order to get their interest. And interest was uh, offered to, uh, shown to us. And as an outcome of this meeting, Mayor of the city sent a letter uh, to UNDP, and they joined uh, making city resilience UNISDR campaign. Uh, next step, it was a uh, organizing organizing a workshop in the resilience concept and presentation of roadmap of uh, for Stepanovan resilience building to large group of uh, large group of organization starting from governmental, like local authorities, as well as also non-governmental organization, educational and uh, health institutions, and also to private sectors. Of course, there were a couple of things we have organized for them, giving an uh, understanding what does it mean disaster risk reduction and what does it mean resilience, especially urban resilience building. Uh, and then as a result, as an outcome of all of our discussions and meetings was that uh, a lot of organizations raised their interest in order to participate of the city resilience uh, process. Uh, again, another outcome was that uh, city resilience 
committee has been established by the uh, by the order of mayor, as well as uh, functional responsibilities of this uh, committee has been also approved by the mayor, and we have started to work with this committee. Next step was, of course, which is the, also if you aware about these essentials under the uh, uh, building city resilience campaign. Uh, it was a third essential, which is related to. Uh, vulnerability and capacity assessment of the city. It has been done by, uh, done by local NGO with technical support, of course, from our side. And as a result, three years uh, resilience development plan has been developed and int uh, introduced to uh, stakeholders uh, starting from the national level and, of course, mainly to uh, city uh, stakeholders. We have agreed on a resilience plan. Also, we have agreed on the on uh, priorities. What should be done first, and uh, and what should be done in the first year? What should be done in the second and third year? Next step, which is I I do consider it as a very important one, it was a mainstreaming of resilience plan into community development plan. I mentioned that in Armenia communities they always have a they are working on a four years community development plan, and each, after each four years the plan is. Uh, should be updated. And uh, what has been done, what we have achieved, that it was mainstream to uh, four years community uh, development uh, plan. Uh, what has been agreed with this committee, resilience committee, and with the stakeholders? That we will concentrate our efforts specifically on a first year to essentials three, five, six, seven. I mentioned about essentials three, which is about assessment uh, of uh, risk and vulnerability. Essentials 5, 6, 7 is more related to educational and health, building educational and health resilience as well as environmental. And uh, this is also uh, very important for us because as you probably know that World Vision is a child well-being uh, uh, organization working in a way to build the well-being of children. Uh, following implementation uh, projects has been done based on a plan of action and actually I should mention that implementation has been done by several organizations uh, in parallel with World Vision, together with World Vision. It is a UNDP GEF project, uh, UNDP as such, Disaster Risk Reduction uh, Team, Armenian Red Cross Society, UNICEF, of course municipality. Uh, we have uh, somehow uh, what uh, we have established an energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency equipment on the five kindergartens, uh, and then also energy efficiency lighting has been established in the city. From ecological point of view, of course, tree planting because uh, during the winter period in 92 when we had the hard conditions, a lot of forest has been cut it for the heating purposes. And tree planting also has been implemented in this city. Uh, as such, this process of Stepanovan Resilience Building has been introduced to Sendai uh, the RR conference and uh, Stepanovan City got uh, awarded to championship in a resilience uh, and DRR strategy uh, building and uh, planning. Next year, uh, under the DPECO funding, uh, together with UNICEF, World Vision Armenia, together with a local NGO, has been uh, uh, has worked on a continuation of uh, building educational resilience. Uh, and more specifically, uh, we have working, uh, we have implemented initiative which is related to enhancement of school safety uh, project. It means that you can see here the students are working. They are assessing the, by themselves with a, using an electronic uh, web environment, uh, assessing the city and also putting this information into, into the computers and uh, also trying to link. This computer helps them, program helps them to link with the programs related to behavior of children during the different type of disasters. What is preliminary uh, indicators of success? I would say there is a five of them we have taken into consideration. One, it was related to mobilizing of stakeholders. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, that uh, it was, was very important one. And, uh, and developing of multi-year resilience action plan. 
institutionalization of resilience is very important, like having a established a committee or resilience uh, committee in the city and uh, linking it to national structures and mechanisms, uh, capitalizing on existing local capacity and integrating the resilience uh, action plan into development plan. Collaboration was very important. One, we had a very good collab collaboration on the national, uh, regional, as well as specifically on the community level. Uh, on the national level, very important was this amendment of the law. And of course, nomination I would consider it as a uh, big su success for uh, Stepanovan city. When we were discussing to, uh, afterwards with the mayor of the city uh, and asking him what, what it gives to him, although of course the resilience process is, uh, is not finishing by one year or two years, and, uh, but he was talking that he used to work before that as a uh, fire brigade, you know, like uh, always trying to fix some problems which has in the city. And now he has a full picture and very much vision about what is going on, what should be done first, and linking this resilient process uh, with a development process. I think that this is the most important which I would consider it as an uh, achievement for uh, our project as such. Key challenges. Of course, community accountability was one of the challenges, and I think it is more about our mistake rather than is a community mistake because we were so much excited with the uh, developing of plan of action and working together, building of capacity that uh, and the implementing of project that I think that accountability which should be started from the day one, I think we didn't put in a, into consideration uh, enough, I would say. In addition, I should mention that this project was implemented for one year time, all it is continuing in one way or another, but I think that this is the time which we lost this part, and mechanism of accountability and dissemination should be better done. Partnerships, because we have a different organizations together, and of course these organizations have their own agenda, uh, and uh, like uh, for example UN, uh, agencies, uh, World Vision, Red Cross, that to get together in a, uh, in implementation of the process, it takes a time. I mean, time related to coordination of our efforts. Next step, uh, which I considered as a coordination challenge, it is related to structure of the city as such. Not all organizations, uh, uh, of course, they are in a way belongs to city, like uh, like gas and electricity agencies. Uh, they are they have uh, they are independent organizations, and uh, they they are not linked to municipality as such. And from point of view of coordination uh, between several organizations, including a private sector, municipal sector, and municipality, it was a bit of challenging. And another challenge I would consider that implementation of vulnerability and capacity assessment in urban context. It takes much more time than we, are, we have expected because uh, it should be adapted from rural context to urban context and uh, that is a bit of time consuming. And recommendations. Uh, I think that existence of capacity is essential for resilience building. But even more uh, important, I think, existence of interest or ownership. I think if there is an uh, ownership of interest from the community side, then capacity is always possible to build, uh, inviting by technical persons. Uh, inclusion of resilience plan into development plan, I think, the key uh, for the uh, success of the process. Uh, ensure that project partners and municipality understand community accountability purpose, approaches and mechanisms is very important. This will improve community's sense of ownership and project sustainability. This is what I was mentioning, mentioning as a challenge in a slide before. Collaboration and coordination between international humanitarian organization, uh, development organization and local uh, actors uh, is key for a resilience building. Uh, resilience strategy should be flexible to size of the city and resilience objectives. In some cases, maybe you should go for several objectives, but uh, if some, you have some kind of achievements, then you can take all, uh, one objective and just work and build, trying to build the resilience around this objective as such, it, based on a progress which city has, has a, uh, as such. And involvement of government and organization on national, regional, and community level ensures more comprehensive approach in resilience building. It means that we shouldn't concentrate only on a one level. We have to work also on a 
on the upper level, on the regional and uh, as well as national level. And local advocacy is very important. And to use, for example, such kind of tools like civic uh, civil voice uh, voice of, of action, and to have as much as possible people, citizens on the board, I think is very important, very essential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gergen, very much for that presentation, and uh, and thank you everybody for for sticking with us. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Philippe to to really discuss the case studies and and open up our session for discussion. I, I like the two case studies because because Mogadishu we find what's really about resilience building, and that resilience building you can really focus on one thing um, to make a resilient city, and and if you link resilience building to urban economics. Uh, you can achieve a resilient city. Whereas in Stepanovan City, it's really more about resilience planning and how resilience planning should be integrated and collaborative, participatory, inclusive, empowering for all. Um, so really, I'm asking all to, to really focus on how the case studies inform the recommendations. And also, if you have any questions related to this recommendations in general, uh, please please bring them up as well. But for now, I'm going to turn things over to Philippe. To, uh, to serve as sort of an ombudsman. And I think Philippe is a great, I'm really happy that Philippe agreed to this because you know, in his role in UN Habitat and now um, working on the World Humanitarian Summit uh, Alliance for, for Urban Crises, he's very well versed in both development responses and humanitarian responses. So he's the perfect person to, to kick off our discussion. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Philippe. Thank you all. Um, quite a challenge to move from case studies, uh, very concrete case studies in Mogadishu and uh, Armenia to ideas, recommendations for Habitat 3. And, and just to remind you that that new urban agenda we are talking about is an agenda to be set for the next 20 years. So the language, the commitments we're trying to get from governments are commitments that have a time horizon of 20 years. So that's a big shift in, in, in discussion. So I'll try to while commenting a bit exactly on the global discussions ongoing related back to uh, the concrete case studies as they were presented. Um, first point to make is that this discussion on resilience and specifically on the urban crisis that I mentioned, the humanitarian development divide, has not taken place in the Habitat 3 process so far. So this webinar is a unique moment to start introducing some of that uh, language into the process, hopefully through this Urban Thinkers campus, campus and ourselves, and I'll come back to it um, as part of the Global Alliance for Urban Crisis, we are trying to do a similar effort. Now, why is that uh, discussion not taking place? Partly because the focus has been purely on development, on the track moving forward. If we look at the reality today, uh, there is a realization that more and more crises are happening, uh, are protracted, are taking a longer term, and humanitarian response is struggling to keep up and is not, uh, not solving the problem. The second thing that we realize um, is that as urbanization is unplanned and happening mostly in fragile settings, urban risk is accumulating very fast. So the risk of major urban crises in the future is only increasing. And the development side of um, the debate is not paying enough attention to, uh, to that fact. Now, strangely enough, on the humanitarian side uh, of the global debate, this realization has uh, struck home very clearly in the last year. Uh, I wanted to mention, apart from Habitat 3, another major event which is on the horizon and is happening in May this year. It's an event organized by the Secretary General and it's called the World Humanitarian Summit. If you want to know more, uh, go to worldhumanitariansummit.org and you will get a, a rundown on what this is about. The essence there, and this uh, consultation has been ongoing for over uh, a year and a half now, mobilizing about 23,000 people, talking about how to reshape AIDS, how to be better prepared to deal with the crisis of the future. Uh, and one important document there, and once I'll refer to some of the ideas, is a report that the Secretary General has written called One Humanity Shared Responsibility. That report is setting out some key ideas which resonate very well 
with this discussion on resilience and the recommendations that have been put forward um, in the document presented to you and that are, are, are showing some evidence in the practice as demonstrated in the case studies uh, presented to you earlier on. Now, the report of the Secretary General is structured around five core responsibilities and he called exactly a shared responsibility of, um, of, of governments worldwide, of all actors, uh, making the same case as with the Sustainable Development Goals that if we want to reach sustainable development, if we want to prevent and respond better to crisis, we need to have all actors on board. Um, core responsibility one, leadership, global leadership to prevent crisis and conflict. Um, one of the key ideas there is to stay engaged. And we can see from the case studies, um, mostly talking about projects in specific context, staying engaged, building resilience requires a much longer term effort to really build resilience on a city-wide scale, take into account its different components. Um, I think as illustrated by, I think, the case from uh, uh, Armenia, it is important that any resilience project, even if we're talking about small-scale initiatives, uh, and we're referring to planting trees, uh, putting in lights, somehow that needs to find its way into longer-term thinking. It's important that any kind of resilience strategy exactly is embedded in a city development strategy that has a longer-term perspective and that pulls in a wide variety of actors. It doesn't matter if you use the word resilience or not, but it really is supposed to draw in the different uh, stakeholders active at the city level and trying to make uh, progress. The second concept under that, under that first core responsibility relates to developing solutions with people. Now, this is something that most of us online, uh, probably especially on the development side, have been used to do. Community participation, community involvement is something we've really, I would say we've made a lot of progress on over the last 10, 15 years. Something on the humanitarian side is something relatively new. It's something we're struggling with because the urgency of response often exactly uh, overrides the needs to working with people and developing solutions with people. So it's interesting to see that in both case studies, that principle, even was in a case like uh, Mogadishu, uh, the situation is quite difficult and complex, uh, and we were responding to acute needs of vulnerable groups. The intent was there to develop solutions with people from, uh, from the start. So very important aspect, uh, thinking about uh, the recommendations also going, uh, going forward. Referring to responsibility four, another quarter, and I would say for me one of the most important ones. It's basically saying on the humanitarian side, we should stop focusing on delivering aid and shifting to ending needs. Now that's a massive shift in the way we should be operating and that itself exactly is demanding of us to much more, even in humanitarian actions, put on a development hat and look at uh, really building out risk and building out need and vulnerabilities with specific um, communities. Uh, I found it interesting exactly in the uh, example of, uh, of Mogadishu that the idea of livelihoods was very much linked with, with the local economy and making sure that somehow we were working to strengthen that local economy and it's in itself reducing the need to, to support through cash and have more uh, access to, to small, uh, small jobs and strengthening the, the economy. So that, that shift in mindset and um, listening to the presenter, you could wonder, is, are we talking about IRC as a humanitarian responder or is IRC responding as a development actor? I would argue that that difference is not important. I think it's, it's using the right types of engagement, the right types of tools to deal with a specific situation, making sure exactly that we move away from just delivering aid, even in the form of cash, to ending needs, especially uh, as we're looking at uh, context with longer term uh, crisis situations, or in the case of Armenia, with an underlying urban risk, uh, the risk of earthquakes, which is, which is there and is there to stay, and it can always come back at any point in time. Now, this responsibility for exactly has a few key um, action areas, uh, which are relevant to this discussion and I think should come through in the uh, recommendations on uh, resilience. One is reinforce existing systems, do not replace. 
Um, again, the example of Mogadishu, working with local market systems. Don't come up with your own uh, kind of livelihood solutions that have nothing to do with the local market and the local economy. Make sure, even on mobility, look at what's happening in terms of uh, the mobility in Mogadishu and use something that is starting to happen and try to build on that and make it stronger and create opportunities for the most vulnerable that is to be left behind. Second key concept, anticipate. And this is a major challenge, of course, uh, referring to the example of Armenia. They managed to put this idea of anticipate, of, of assessing risks into the responsibilities of local governments. But of course, there's a massive question there of how actually do you act on that? How do you, once you identify the risk, and this is a public, public knowledge, public, public information, comes with it an accountability to actually build out that risk over time. And of course, in, in a lot of situations, take into account governance, access to land, uh, financial situations, economies, that's not something that happens overnight, that's not something that happens in a project. But starting to work on that down the road, step by step, I think is important, as also as illustrated in uh, the case over Armenia. Um, additional action area under this concept of ending needs, collective outcomes. Um, a very difficult concept, very easy to say, but it basically means that humanitarian and development actors should work towards the same outcomes. And it's interesting to see that in the run-up to this World Humanitarian Summit, and talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, and I hope the same will happen with the new urban agenda, we're basically saying we are working towards the same targets, because that's only then will we end need, will we have nobody left behind and falling uh, out of the um, development trajectory towards uh, a better uh, better future. As you could hear from uh, the case of, of Armenia, it sometimes comes down to some very difficult exercises of building networks, building engagement between actors with a totally different mandate and a totally different agenda. And the comment was made referring to the different external agencies, but that same problem exists on the, uh, on the local side between the different urban stakeholders let alone the link, as was uh, made also in the case of Armenia, there's difficult relationship then with uh, regional and national, uh, national governments. But very important to have that language, that discussion on collective outcomes, hopefully then articulated properly in city development plans, uh, was, as was the case of Armenia, or as was referred to in the case of um, Mogadishu, linking smaller scale area-based approaches where different actors come together to the larger scale kind of city urban response framework as the uh, frameworks as they're being developed at a uh, at a higher level. So also that different scale levels is an important uh, element. Last core responsibility I refer to is investing in humanity and just referring to wanting this need to build local capacity. Uh, and again, I'd, I'm not sure how many of you out there are basically part of a local government or a local NGO most of us probably are part of some international organization, some international actor. One of the major shifts happening, and it's so key when you're talking about resilience, is this idea of building local capacities, making ourselves unnecessary in being there. And if we're needed, that we really focus on building on what is ongoing, on building local capacities and supporting, uh, supporting local communities, and so the self-sustainability uh, ultimately is, is what we have. This key element of resilience I think is captured in some of the recommendations that you have uh, in front of you. Um, I hardly have used the word urban so far. Um, and again, even if you read to the World Humanitarian Summit in the initial documents, if you look at the report of Secretary General, this notion that the world is urbanizing is absent from this humani broader humanitarian and development community. We've, evidently, when you talk about the new urban agenda and the stakeholders mobilized around it, most of them are urban interested urban stakeholders. This humanitarian development community in the broader sense is absent from the debate or has been not fully acknowledging this new reality that the world is urbanizing. And secondly, exactly that also crises, emergencies are urbanizing. Um, this shift in environment, I think, is something that through these recommendations we also need to articulate clearly that that's a new reality uh, and some people in OCHA will now exactly finally start saying that this is the new normal this is the new normal for their operating uh, environments the second thing that people seem to ignore uh, often once they realize that an urban setting just the complexity of urban areas uh, a complexity which is also at the core 
of the resilience agenda, how to have a more holistic approach, understanding the interlinkages between different uh, actions between social networks, economic networks, uh, governance issues, and the spatial reality on how the city is organized. The systems approach kind of thinking, which you will see reflected in some of the recommendations, is key. We should be moving away from just a focus, which humanitarians used to do, individual needs of households and families, to also be able to think at the neighborhood level, at the city level. And it's interesting to see exactly again that in, in both cases, uh, Mogadishu and uh, Armenia, that, that thinking is there of not to be limited, to just focusing on identifying people in needs and providing direct assistance to them, but making sure it also links to the way the city is functioning, the way the city is organized. So, a few words on, on this Global Alliance for Urban Crisis. We've been um, mobilizing exactly a new set of stakeholders to take this discussion forward. Very clear that this, yes, it is about humanitarian development, but we can only have this discussion meaningful if we bring on board local authorities. We're working with the United Cities and Local Government Association. If we bring on board the professional associations, the urban uh, professionals, but also the local government professionals, and have them in the room with us. And thirdly, also, that's what we call the, the research community, the academic community, because one thing that is, we're struggling with, uh, and Sam referred to it in the beginning, is the evidence base. Uh, the, are we really building resilience? Uh, how do we know that we have, after a year or two years we have made a difference in having more resilient communities or resilient cities? A very difficult topic which uh, correctly requires a complete uh, set, a different set of discussions. Now, in the run-up to the World Humanitarian Summit, we mobilized this different set of stakeholders at the global level. We're coming up with what is a real kind of an issue-based coalition, uh, this Global Alliance for Urban Crisis, we have set forward a set of principles and are very much aligned with some of the ideas and the recommendations uh, before you. And we are committed to turn this into global, local initiatives exactly that start making a difference on the ground. Uh, and really putting in place, aiming at impact at scale, thinking in five, ten years, in a five, ten year horizon. Uh, and just to give one example uh, is, is on, of course, on the, the needed capacities that takes time. That's not something that happens within this, the framework of one project, nor in a project of a couple of years. It requires a much longer term uh, effort. So that's the commitment of the Global Alliance. Uh, and again, uh, we hope you will also join up to the, the principles behind it at some point. Now, coming to an end on, on my part and looking forward uh, to uh, read some of your questions, one of the challenges that we're having in front of us is that the new urban agenda as I said in the beginning, hasn't been paying attention to this subject or insufficiently paid attention to this subject so far. We've been making the core argument that, uh, as I said in the beginning, more and more of these cities are in crisis or at risk of falling in crisis, and it's very important to give them specific attention to bring them back onto the development, or to allow them to come back onto development trajectory and evidently within those cities we have highly vulnerable communities not just the urban poor but very often as also in the case of, uh, of uh, Mogadishu a huge number of displaced that ultimately have been weaker rights higher vulnerabilities specific vulnerabilities that need specific attention what does it take um, I do think as you were going through and hopefully have a, time, a, a chance to read the recommendations how to prioritize how to really come up with what are the key essential elements going forward. And to be realistic, uh, the language that will find its way in, uh, into the new urban agenda is not going to be more than half a page. So how, what are the key ideas uh, laid out in the recommendations, I think is something I would really encourage you to think about. Um, for me, all the recommendations are valid. They're highly valid, they're highly uh, inspiring, but I do think it is important to put the finger where this will make a difference in the new urban agenda going forward. So I'll end there with uh, the first part. Uh, hopefully, adding on to the evidence base given by the case studies, uh, we have started answering some of the questions that were put out in the discussion that came of the earlier uh, question sent to us, responsibility of humanitarian actors in building resilience and its link between the different type of actors in uh, building resilience, the idea of, of collaboration and working towards um, collective outcomes. Two questions 
coming forward already from your side. First question. It seems like a shift has happened from humanitarian organi organizations since the Haiti earthquake. Is this a shift that is um, really real? How is resilience making its way into long-term planning? Organizations used to short-term planning. My answer to that is, is there is a big challenge here still in the mindset of organizations. By nature, the financing uh, is going to be short term. We are talking about one year funding. The discussion of pushing humanitarian funding to multi year funding in crisis setting, especially protected crisis setting. Um, but the way organizations are organized, that still will be a limited reality set against the challenges of building resilience in the longer term. And this whole idea that we're shifting from a focus on our projects, on our external actions, to really seeing what are the local dynamics, what the local actors are doing, and finding ways of supporting that. Each of us finding the best entry point based on our skill sets and based on what we can contribute based on our mandates, but being aware that our action, our initiative, is only a small part in a much broader effort of building resilience. So that finding that link between what we can do now, making sure there does no harm, but somehow is an investment, and any humanitarian action is ultimately also a financial investment it does has to contribute to those longer term uh, planning ideas and longer term strengthening of uh, resilience. Uh, but moving on to the second question. Uh, building on the presentation by Abdiaziz, what role have the speakers seen for local institutions in the long, long term link to uh, resilient development? I'll give it back to Sam in a second. Um, I think one thing I wanted to point out, and, and this exactly might be a different situation in Mogadishu than in, um, in the case of Armenia. In fragile settings such as Mogadishu, uh, and Abdi Zaziz can probably <laughs> testify to that, um, people in, in power, local leaders come and go. There's a lot of political shift happening, a lot of fragility in that kind of the way uh, governance is organized, and so hence the importance to really be inclusive in the processes. Uh, something that uh, the case of Armenia, the speaker of Armenia, Gurkin, pointed out to is accountability to communities from the start. The importance of really making sure that they're part of the thinking, because ultimately they will make the difference and they will drive the agenda, and they will also then insist with their local leaders having their voice heard in the discussion on the longer term development that we somehow stay on track and that it's really building on the vision and possible roles of different stakeholders galvanized then by, uh, by local leaders. Abdi, is this first? Um, yes, um, to answer that question, I think, I think Mogadishu um, is again unique. The, as a previous speaker said, we, we have a, a major problem with, with the turnover of, of local government, of, of people in, in political power. And in addition to that, a very, very weak government that, that may not be able to afford or fund or even have the capacity to, to implement such, such, such interventions. Um, so I think, I think for us, we, we've realized the limitations of what the government could offer or has to offer. And we're really looking at a, a, a community approach. I mean, a lot of these communities have, for the past 25 years, managed to to, to organize themselves, mobilize themselves, and take care of their own um, without the need of a government in place. So we, we, we actually are looking at using these existing mechanisms that are in place with the, the neighborhoods, with the communities, with, with people who have been doing this without a government. And, and that's why we're trying to develop these plans. That's why we're trying to do an early warning system. And we'll obviously uh, enable the, the local government and, and try to strengthen them to, to better um, prepare their own plans. But we, we, we're going for a community first approach because that's where we see the real strength in, in, in Mogadishu and in Somalia as a whole. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. A lot of other comments have come in and specific questions on the, on the presentations. We, we won't go into them, but one comment I wanted to highlight, of course, I mean, we mentioned the World Trade Summit, we're talking about the new urban agenda, but evidently the Sendai framework 
is also a very useful framework and commitment amongst governments to deal with risk in a different way. So just an important point to highlight that. I will give it back to Leah now because it's time for you to really express your opinions. Thanks, Philippe. Um, so for the next section, what we're going to do is get your thoughts. And uh, as, as Sam has mentioned earlier, it's really important that you've been able to look at that uh, list of recommendations because we're going to get your thoughts through some, um, some quick polls to, to hear what you think about these recommendations and whether these um, are really the, the issues at the core here. So we've got seven different questions to ask you and we're going to go through and do them um, in turn. So um, the first poll that we have for you asks, Urban resilience provides an adequate framework through which we may bridge the humanitarian and development divide. And so all of these things are based on the recommendation. So read this statement and, uh, and then you've got a, uh, five different options that you can answer. I'll let a few more votes come in, but uh, I'll tell you what we've got so far. We've got 65% of you who voted agreeing, 14% strongly agreeing, 13% neutral, 1% disagreeing and 6% strongly disagreeing. So quite a, a big show of support for agree on this statement, but a wide range of views uh, represented here in the webinar. The next question or statement rather we have for you to cast your thoughts on is the recommendations. So these are the ones in the handout that you've already received. These recommendations cover humanitarian and crisis response considerations required in planning and building resilient cities. With 70% of you voted so far, the results are that 49% of you who voted so far agree with this statement, 33% feel neutral, neither disagreeing nor agreeing, and 14% disagree. That the remaining is 1% who strongly disagree and 3% who strongly agree. So overall, most people agreeing or quite neutral on this statement. The next question we have to pose to you is, the recommendations adequately cover durable development solutions required in planning and building resilient cities. 38% of you are, are in the middle. Uh, I think this might be uh, as a result of, of doing this quite quickly. So do feel free to let us know uh, why you're um, feeling neutral about this uh, statement. You're tied currently between neutral and agree with 36% each, 20% of you disagree, 3% strongly disagree, and 5% strongly agree, uh, with the numbers slightly shifting ever so much as the last few people cast their vote. Again, all the final uh, results we'll share after the, um, the webinar itself. Okay, so the next statement that we have to hear your thoughts about is that recommendations that you already have in your uh, handout are useful for humanitarian development and local actors as a general framework for building resilient cities. Just over half of you have voted now, and this one uh, has a, so far a 60% agree with only 16% neutral, 16% strongly agreeing, 10% disagreeing, and so far, no one strongly disagreeing. So I'm going to move on to the next poll. This statement, we are asking what you think to the recommendations address concerns around vulnerable, displaced, and marginalized populations and their role in resilience building. So as the last few people hopefully cast their vote, we have 42% with agree, 25% at neutral, 18% at disagree, 11% at strongly agree, and then 5% at strongly disagree. So quite a range on this one, but most people, or the highest number of people at least, saying agree. So we're going to move on to the second last statement. So this one asks you to let us know what you think to this statement. The recommendations address the shocks, stresses, and hazards that cities face and the need for a holistic understanding of resilience. 
So far, 37% agree. And in a close second, 31% remain neutral on this statement. 22% of you disagree. And 10% strongly agree. Okay. The final statement we want your thoughts about is that these recommendations are applicable to all cities, regardless of their capacities, resources, or level of risk. So with just over half of you voting so far, 45% of you agree, 20% remain neutral, 14% disagree, 16% strongly agree, and 4% strongly disagree. I'm now going to hand back to Sam uh, for some final thoughts. Thanks, Leah, um, and thanks to all of you for, for your feedback and, and for, um, for, for really getting your thoughts in there. I think it's really important. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, the polling was really just a chance for us to... Uh, to, to get your initial thoughts on the recommendations. I know that we shared them with you uh, just four hours ahead. Part of that was intentional just so uh, you know, we could get some your quick thoughts on them. And then after the webinar, now that you sort of understand the background of them, you can really take your time. And I hope uh, that you'll, you'll, you'll take the chance to, to click on the link that we send you after this webinar wraps. You'll have seven days to send that to your colleagues to really get your thoughts on each recommendation specifically um, and and what you think is missing and, and what you think is good and, and we should really make sure is included in, in the final recommendation. I particularly want to hear the people who either strongly disagree or strongly agree um, on our recommendations. I think it's really important and I'm actually glad that there are people who strongly disagree because that means that there are opinions out there that we haven't yet considered, um, particularly on questions like, are we considering all mon marginalized, vulner uh, marginalized and vulnerable populations? Um, are we adequately considering their, their needs and are we adequately um, putting forth ways to, to actively engage them and to have them participate in resilience building because I think that's tremendously important. So that's just one area, you know, if, if there's a particular vulnerable population, I know that sometimes we tend to focus on youth and not elderly or, or things like that. Please, please make your, your opinions heard. Um, for the finalization of the recommendations, a report comes out on February 25th. That report uh, is specific to our recommendations, but it feeds into the larger The City We Need Draft 2.0 um, that will be finalized at the end of February. Uh, I encourage you to check out Ur the World Urban Campaign's website where they have all the other urban campuses and, uh, and, and get to know about all the other great efforts that, that some of our, our partners are doing. Um, special thanks goes to Aline and World vision um, to our presenters Abdiaziz, Gergen, and Philippe. All of your emails are right here um, and you can get at us individually. I do want to point out that tragically Abdiaziz is leaving IRC at the end of the month but he is doing so to pursue further studies um, probably on resilience planning and, and, and really exploring this idea further. So he asked that I include his personal email uh, so you can stay in touch with him as he becomes himself a thought leader in this area. Um, again, thank you all to, to all our, our organizers, our participants, our partners, um, and really appreciate everyone's time. Tweet at us, email us, and above all else, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and enjoy your Thursday.